short agenda like that. Call to order this Thursday, August 29th, Oregon City Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, shall we start with introductions? To my right. Bill Daniels. Troy Bollinger. Chris Cook. Karen Mori. Lisa Novak. Alicia Ham. Jeff Sargent. Bill Lewis. Christina Robertson Gardner. Thank you. And I think we had one excused absence, Mr. Doug Neely. Yes, Doug Neely is not able to be here tonight. Uh, neither is Derek. Okay, very good. Uh, do you have the agenda in front of you on your screen? Or? Okay, so citizen comments on issues and items not on the agenda. It uh, doesn't look like we have any citizen comments. So that would move us on to general business, uh, Beaver Creek Concept Plan Area Parks. And uh, so to start off with that, um, today with us we have Christina Robertson Gardner, Senior Planner with Oregon City. And um, we're talking about, as we uh, had her here a couple of months ago, to talk about the uh, development of mm -hmm. the Beaver Creek Area Concept Plan and as a kind of general overview. And then uh, she was going to come back to give a little bit more context as it relates to parks and the vision that we have for the uh, park um, development, what's there, and how we go about with the acquisition of, of park space in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan area. So with that, I will turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, my goal tonight is to talk a little bit about where we are in the process for zoning code amendments and how you are involved in this little piece of the zoning and code amendments. Uh, sorry. I guess we can... Turn down the lights. Turn it on, that helps. There we go. So just the big picture, in 2008, the Beaver Creek Road concept plan was adopted. It was one of the three urban growth boundary expansion areas. Uh, what you see here is general bullets of what they adopted in 2008. Uh, what we are in now is, uh, and my job has been, and planning's job has been, is to take a 60 page or 40, 60 page narrative document with watercolor pictures and turn it into code. Uh, we have to require kind of a clear and objective process to um, when people come in to be able to share, share with them the requirements to develop. Right now there's also um, a fair amount of properties that are inside the city limits but are holding their county zone, uh, future urban 10 acres, and so this process will also rezone the properties that are already inside the city limits to their appropriate Beaver Creek Road concept plan zone. Uh, at the time of two, the 2008 Beaver Creek concept plan, it had between 1,000 and 1,600 housing units. Through the analysis we've been doing this spring, we have our magic number is about 1,100. So that's the number of uh, dwelling units we're looking at accommodating in this area. And uh, the 5,000 jobs is, is what we see for the, uh, the non-residential zoning opportunities. This was the map that was adopted in 2008. We call it the watercolor map. Uh, what you see is uh, different zoning, I mean, different development districts. The light blue is more of the campus industrial. That's the zone we're identifying. Uh, the purple area is the mixed use uh, corridor two, which is kind of the area it, which is near and around uh, Beaver Creek Road and Malala Avenue today. So a little bit higher um, office retail, we're allowing some additional industrial uses. So kind of a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, that, big red dot you see right at Glen Oak Road is the neighborhood commercial two block Main Street. Uh, kind of buildings right up to the street with sidewalk, cafes ideally, and parking in the rear. Uh, and then the two yellow colors are a combination of uh, different densities of residential. But where you're at tonight, uh, you'll see some green. And the uh, Two, really the, the three things we're, I'm going to bring up tonight and looking for kind of general direction and comments back to Phil as we move forward uh, in this process. We have a linear park, which I'll talk about, and that is along the uh, east side of the Holly Lane Extension, and Holly Lane Extension is parallel to Beaver Creek Road. Uh, there's the East Ridge Conservation Area, and that's kind of right at the Thimble Creek, touches kind of the Thimble Creek Canyon. And then there are um, some power, the PPA power line easement trail opportunities. So three things I'm going to lay out tonight. 
our goal is to kind of tell you where we are today. It's not fully baked, but we want to get your feedback and recommendations and comments. And at, when it's ready to come back, we will pro provide you kind of three exhibits, exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C, and exhibit A will be the two parks, and those will be added to the parks master plan as amendments through this process. It'll be about a one page informational, think about a one page flyer where you have some you know, diagram and some bullets that provide clarity, but enough flexibility that we can, um, uh, you know, be able to develop based on what's the parks, based on what, you know, development applications come in. And then the trails, so exactly what the width of the trail is and uh, what's going to be required. So those are the three pieces um, that PRAC really is going to be involved in is kind of making that formal recommendation of those three exhibits. The coding and zoning amendments, the code and zoning amendments are currently at the Planning Commission level and they are kind of all through the fall we'll be having hearings and we're having topics about every two weeks for each of the hearings. At some point after the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee has kind of made a recommendation on these exhibits, we'll share that to the Planning Commission that will get folded in to the Planning Commission's recommendation that will go to the City Commission. And this final process, the City Commission will adopt new zoning for the area, adopt new comprehensive plan map, adopt new zoning code, and make any needed amendments to the comprehensive plan or ancillary documents to the comprehensive plan, which would be like, the parks master plan, the trails master plan, and like the transportation system plan. So there'll be a big ordinance sometime in 2020 that has all of these as one big package. So we wanna make sure that we do it right and get enough kind of that balance of certainty and flexibility in the parks master plan for these parks. So where we are now is we took this watercolor map and on June 7th, we have our proposed zoning map, and these are all available on our project website, which you can find on the planning page. And it's pretty close to the watercolor map. There's a few little tweaks, um, but they generally align to where we were in the 2008 vision. Uh, this is a map our consultant team this spring put together that kind of really overlaid the BPA power lines, the streams, the steep slopes, the geologic hazards, and in pink, kind of the overlay of this, this linear park. So you can kind of see there's a lot of development opportunities, but there's also a lot of constraints. Um, so we've been working kind of how, as development comes in, we can um, regulate and, and acquire um, parks. So what we're doing, which is unique, we have not done so far yet in Oregon City for development applications, as part of this package, we will be writing code to do parks acquisition and dedication at time of a development application, which is very, uh, which we haven't had really a chance to do because a lot of our development applications in Oregon City are really small, like 12 lot subdivisions or 20 lot subdivisions. You can't really exact a three acre park from a 28 lot subdivision. <laughs> so usually what you do is you are looking ahead and you're finding park space and it kind of happens parallel to a development application. We're in this situation, a lot of these parcels are owned by the same entity. So when development comes in, it'll probably be big chunks of development. And so this is a time for us to be able to proportionally exact park space, not necessarily require them to build it, but to set that land aside as part of a subdivision application. So the, the goal really is to work with our attorneys and figure out what our limits of our proportional exaction are, how many dwelling units are in as part of a subdivision application, how can we um, you know, how can we use a mathematical clear and objective formula to output how much land we can acquire? Uh, let's, for example, you had a certain number of number of unit subdivision, you know, 200 lot subdivision or, you know, a bunch of multifamily housing and out, you did your, you did your um, clear and objective metric and output was six acres of um, parks. Well, we now would have um, uh, two parks now adopted to the parks master plan that we could then um, say we need the park space here and here and we can acquire that proportionally. So that's the kind of things we're working on this fall is getting that language right, getting the, the legal things right. That being said, um, you know, Phil Lewis and the parks department can also do willing buyer, willing seller acquisition of anything above the required exaction. So it's, it might be a little combination of your development application will require this amount of parks space, but 
willing seller, willing buyer, we may be able to augment that a little bit bigger. So we're trying to see what that combination is. Uh, we are still working on that and I, we kind of feel can share that with you as the, the, the hearings process goes on. So what I'd like to do now is kind of talk to you about the two parks and the trails and kind of what we're thinking on right now, what would be the exhibits that would be added to the parks master plan. Once again, this is just to get enough detail to acquire the park. And um, then there would be just a, there would be a separate parks planning process. So the, the developer wouldn't necessarily build the park unless there was some SDC reduction or uh, you know, development agreement, but it would provide enough detail to acquire the park. So the first one is the linear park pearl and string approach. So on the left side of the screen, this is what the 2008 uh, uh, plan kind of showed it really is this linear park that goes um, from um, pretty close up to uh, just below Loader Road all the way down through the process on the east side of that Holly Lane extension. And what you see on the right is what our consultants translated that to. That's in pink. So what the linear pearl and string we're kind of looking at is in the, in the plan, they talk about it's uh, multiple parks could be in that overlay. And what we really want to see is a way to really connect the parks. So even in one individual park may not be um, a community sized park or, uh, but to aggregate together, we consider all as one park. So it's really the string part is a, a ped bikeway, which would be on the east side of the Holly Lane extension road. So imagine if you will, um, instead of having curb, five foot planter strip, five foot sidewalk, it would go curb 30 feet and inside of that 30 feet would be um, a ped bikeway and maybe it meanders a little bit. There might be some landscaping or a, you know, a, a, a bench here and there. And that's the string. And then as development comes in, we can negotiate proportionally to put pearls in. So over time, you'll have the pearls that make up kind of the full park but not every pearl will be built at the same time. But the string will be actually part of the right-of-way. So the pearls will be parks and the string will be right-of-way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now we're just kind of looking at potential uh, bullets that we put in this exhibit. So uh, once the first, the first section is that 30-foot ped bikeway, we're looking at about three to four pearls of various sides spread along that open space network. We think we want to have a minimum and maximum pearl size. We're not too sure yet, so any comments from the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee tonight would be nice. Also, a minimum con uh, combined size of all pearls we really see as a minimum of eight acres. And that I'll let uh, Phil talk a little bit about the thought process that got to that. Yeah. And then uh, we do want to have some minimum average widths and depths just to make sure someone's not trying to give us a, like a, you know, a 5,000 foot long, you know, 20 foot wide park, that's <laughs> not what we want. So those are just some like, yeah, yeah we gotta get a real size park. Yeah. And then uh, the other big piece, we want at least five acres to be developed with active recreation components. So some can be passive recreation, but, but we do want to put in the parks master plan that there's a certain number of acres that have to be active recreation components. And so additional bullets can be added to this, but it's always looking at that balance of flexibility and certainty. What do we really wanna make sure is in there? Because when you amend something to the comprehensive plan and you don't want it, you got to amend the comprehensive plan in the middle of an application. So only put in the things you really think are needed to sh you know, really shape what this is. Um, so that's the linear park and pearl. Maybe, Phil, do you want to yeah, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So the um, conversations that we've had with planning is, you know, what are we really looking to get for out of our park system? What are the, you know, um, we can set the set the stage for the developer, but they may, you know, suggest doing a, you know, ten foot wide, you know, one mile long. <laughs> like this is this is our park that we proposed for you. So looking at the minimum widths, you know, some of the things that, you know, um, Glen Oak Park or Wesley Lynn Park have about a five hundred foot width. And they're kind of linear in nature to give you kind of a, a sense of both of those spaces as you're looking at um, the the field space. Uh, we have a three acre minimum uh, size requirement for our typical neighborhood parks, 
And so when we're looking at the Perl and, and string approach, you know, are we okay with doing a, um, a, a two acre instead of a three acre and then allowing additional, you know, connectivity and knowing that you'll still get that overall minimum eight acres of combined space. Does that provide enough of the active recreation components within that acreage to assume that you'll be able to have the types of amenities that the public's looking for within a neighborhood park um, piece of property? Um, you know, do we want, again, um, to the uh, active recreation components? This is a big piece for us. You know, we've made some um, uh, acquisitions in our history of providing park service that um, you know developments near uh, Barkley Hills Park as an example there is a small section where the playground is located but then it very quickly goes into kind of a ravine um, and so a lot of the acreage isn't really usable active recreation space so really making sure that we aren't backing ourselves into a corner with things but we want to be able to provide that active recreation space while at the same time still being able to provide some of those you know, natural components uh, being connected to some of the um, habitat areas or, you know, um, NROD areas. It should be fine, but we don't want the whole park to be an NROD area where we're not able to provide the active recreation piece. So being able to give uh, enough flexibility to the developer, but still be able to get the types of amenities we're really looking for out of our park system. So the next, the second park is kind of the, this East Ridge Park, and it's also called the Thimble Creek Conservation Area. And um, when you read through the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, this whole park is about a paragraph and five or six bullets. So, and when you read it, it's a little confusing about exactly what it is. And so actually what you see in the planning packet for the planning commission our consultant staff actually wrote a version that is really um, private open space but it tells you how you can get the intent of that park mm -hmm. and talking to um, phil lewis i think there was a, a goal of the parks department to have this more as a public park so uh, that's one of the um, questions I'm, we're kind of sending back to Parks and, and Parks and Rec is, you know, should we amend the existing proposed code to be more of a public park approach? And that would be really adopting this um, uh, Parks Master Plan appendix. So what, let me tell you a little bit about what the, how they describe it in the plan. And once again, it's the green area and then this X area. So this is to your left, the 2008 plan. And what you see on the right is what our consultants put together this spring. So they want two public viewpoints. They don't talk about the size. Oh, and let me explain a little bit. This is really fascinating. Um, maybe you, you, I can talk, yeah. So there is a Thimble Creek runs kind of at the bottom of the canyon right here. Can you all see my arrow? And then the way our natural resource overlay district runs is there's a net and rod, a natural resource overlay stream buffer on either side. I think that gets you about halfway up the canyon. And then about elevation 490 is kind of the ridge. And so the way that you look at the plan, it says there's a gap here between the top of the ridge and the, the Natural Resource Overlay District. We want this to be a conservation area, and we want half of it to not be developed. It's kind of what it says in the plan. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we are, kind of that's what we started off. And I'll show you a little bit of one way to, so this is kind of taking from the plan. They want two public viewpoints, generally one at the south, generally one at the north. Um, half of the area between the stream buffer and the 490 ridge line to be open space. But to make sure, once again, that you just don't do the whole thing right down below, they want at least a 700 foot non interrupted view corridor right up along the ridge line. Uh, and to provide a forest trail from one viewpoint to another, so you kind of like dip into the hillside and pop back up. And that would be a forest trail, not a shared youth path. 
And then staff recommends to indicate that this area is a public open space. So that, that those kind of metrics would do when a development came in, we would say, okay, figure out where your road is, figure out where your homes are, because there's going to be nice homes on the ridge line, and they'll have geologic hazard review. But where's your 700 foot view corridor? And go do the math and figure out what that area is between the edge of the stream buffer and the top of the ridge line, and half of that's a public open space. And so really the open space is that half of that area, the two viewpoints, size to be determined. So that's something we can talk and come back and see like what's the minimum viewpoint we would want. And then this kind of trail that um, kind of connects the two. So that's the East Ridge Thimble Creek Conservation Area. And that kind of would in some sense be, um, you could ideally take the pearl and string shared use path of linear park and kind of end up at the southern end of this. So they do kind of connect up at the southern end. So that's the East Ridge Thimble Creek Conservation Area. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Phil? No, I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, power lines, <coughs> you'll notice there's a lot of areas in gray, and those are all BP, BPA power lines. So when, you're, when the BPA power lines are near where the Myers Road extension is today, they're all together, and then they cross, they kind of, they have two different ones. And so, uh, and then they come back together again. It's kind of convoluted. Uh, so this was always intended to allow, and this is all campus industrial zone to the north of Loader Road. This is always intended to allow, you know, you can park underneath easements, you can put road, I mean, park underneath the BPA power line, you can, put roads underneath the BPA power line, um, landscaping, as long as there's not trees, big trees. Um, so we thought there is space to put a trail somewhere in here, but we also, this, the whole thing isn't a trail because as you can see, there's not a lot of white and the white is where the buildings are. And so they wanna maximize that area for the buildings and how do we use parking and circulation can be more pushed towards these gray areas and at what place makes sense to have this this uh, trail. And so I might pass it over to Phil a little bit to think what he's thinking of. My thinking is the kind of how do we create jobs in this city? This is one of the last and best places we can bring living wage jobs to Oregon City. So I'm always trying to figure out like how can we, you know, as a Lego, the cookie cutter, how can we get this in? Um, but also acknowledge there is a great opportunity for these east-west connections and to get people to walk and People like to walk at lunch, you know, how to get people to walk that's not Luda Road. So there's lots of ways, opportunities, and reasons why we want to have trails in this area. So right now our minimum recognition is a 35 foot wide, yeah, 30 foot trail width with a 10 to foot wide paved path. Somewhere, so you know, you'd, the first person in kind of starts to shadow plat and we kind of take a look and then that's, we're kind of, that's, that path is, that trail is there, but so is the road and so is parking and insight circulation for the other yeah. parts of the BPA easement. And from uh, Park's, Park's perspective, uh, looking at these corridors, um, obviously there are some, some wide swaths uh, and we don't want to negatively impact the ability of the property owners to, to build out to their capacity to provide jobs and opportunities there. Um, but with the trail system, we need to identify ways to um, provide open, accessible, uh, safe feeling, even if they are safe in design, but just if you have um, pinch points or corridors that have build outs on both sides, as opposed to, you know, a 30 foot wide uh, trail design by itself is fine. Um, but if you have an eight foot fence on one side and, you know, um, garbage receptacle area on the other side, it's not going to be very appealing for folks to use. So we want to make sure that we're identifying ways to provide these spaces in a way that they are, are usable and that they're an amenity for both the development for the businesses as well as residents and, and future uh, people using these sites. So trying to identify ways to incorporate um, our check boxes for what those look like uh, to ensure that we have a, a usable uh, trail system. Uh, one thing that um, 
you know, when I was in the Dells, uh, we worked with, with Google to build out and they had some very particular um, you know, security needs at their data resource centers and um, you know, very strict measures that they needed to, to keep up on their properties. And it was directly adjacent to our um, riverfront trail system. And so trying to make sure that we had these, um, uh, these corridors with setbacks enough for um, you know, to, to have a sense of, of safety and security, even if the, the trail by itself was enough, but, to, you know, what's around the trail. And so making, really making sure that we're building in that conversation piece and what we can ask from the developers as opposed to needing to ask for, you know, a 50 foot width. So instead, you know, we'll ask for, you know, the 30 foot width, but what are the other things that we really need to take into consideration as we're developing the, this trail system? I have two more slides and maybe we can open up to a larger conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, during this time, we, when I, we went out to the public engagement this spring, we heard a lot from the public about the width of the public road and was there design and signals and roundabouts, which is better. And so we did, um, we actually asked our transportation consultant, DKS Associates, and we asked them a lot of those same questions. And if you're interested, that memo is available at the um, August 13th City Commission work session. It's all attached. Uh, and you can read that. We did go to the City Commission, kind of showed, uh, provided what we've heard. Uh, and there's a technical answer and then there's the community answer. The technical answer is the three lane segment, one travel lane in each direction with a median turn lane with a basically uh, a planted median when you're not having a turn pocket, uh, met the transportation requirements for the rezone. And it met the re transportation requirements for the rezone with either signals at the major intersections like Myers and Loader and Glen Oak or roundabouts. So on a staff answer, we, we had our what meets the requirements for this rezone, but we wanted to go to the city commission because we know we had heard from them and other people in the public that they wanted more information about what does it mean to build a five lane segment, two lanes each direction, that same temp center turn lane in Beaver Creek, how much land would you have to acquire, how big is a roundabout, can you build a roundabout through a normal land use process, it would have to be a capital improvement program. Uh, how big is a five lane roundabout compared to a three lane roundabout. So we are doing some additional research and we're gonna be going back to them either in October or November. And we're also reaching out to the public because um, we generally weren't opening up the concept plan. We're trying to implement the plan was adopted, but because we're looking at this piece, it's a little bit different. We wanna reach out to the public again and make sure we have their comments. So uh, there'll be additional public outreach opportunities this fall on this question and we're learning more uh, about kind of the implications of any of those scenarios of roundabouts, uh, traffic signals, three lanes, five lanes. So I don't know how much that necessarily impacts the parks, but I wanted, people like to talk about traffic all the time. So I wanted to give <laughs> a little feedback of where we are on that and next steps. And uh, once again, through this process, Planning Commission, City Commission, if the Beaver Creek Road cross section or determination of what kind of, it's called intersection control, roundabouts or signals, um, we may amend the transportation system plan accordingly. So once again, it'll all be in that big bucket uh, that the Planning Commission adopts by ordinance. But, and we wanna make sure we have it right because if once we rezone, there could be a land use application coming in the next day and we wanna make sure we have the right street cross section design so we can tell them what we will be able to require for their dedication. That's really all I have for updates. So I might send it back to Phil to have a little bit more of a conversation and I can take notes too. Yeah. So um, again, part of the reason to have this conversation today is to make sure that we uh, don't have any unintended consequences and or that the design criteria that we have in place for the Beaver Creek concept plan area kind of meets with our expectations for providing park services to our community. And so having those um, conversations around the, the connectivity piece, having those conversations around the uh, developed active uh, park spaces, um, our minimums, maximums, what type of um, park design 
would be required for the types of things folks would actually want to participate in in our park system. And so that comes down to the, you know, the minimums and maximums. Uh, we have a requirement or a goal within our park system is to provide uh, six to 10 acres of park per thousand uh, residents. And so looking at the overall kind of what we are anticipating for this area, again, we have kind of that eight acres minimum is what we're looking for. Um, could be a little bit more. We have some additional kind of park amenity pieces, which would be included, you know, the um, multi-use pathways, the um, uh, uh, trail areas uh, under the BPA power lines, as well as the conservation areas and near Thimble Creek. And so the, I, I think maybe Christina might be able to speak a little bit more to the kind of overarching, I, I think in reading through the document, there's a sense that this uh, concept plan area was a little bit different than some of the other areas that well, were. Each concept plan area went through its own unique process. Like all three of them are, they, they found their own little niche, right? Yeah. So like uh, so Park like Place is all about like nature. unique design and alleys. And then, you know, South End is a little bit more green, but there's some, you know, design approach. Beaver Creek doesn't talk any about what the houses look like. They care all about what the streets look like and how green they are and what type of streets and mm -hmm. stormwater. So it's it just, each plan is its own, they have their own vision. And so yeah. it's how do you implement the vision of the plan that was adopted? And yeah. so this plan really looked at integrating new jobs with the college and the high school, and then providing a new neighborhood directly adjacent. So there's opportunities for people to um, walk to work or opportunities for cross commuting. So people are leaving and coming, which helps get transit because it's hard to get transit at the end of the line if you're not picking up anybody else. Mm -hmm. So having a two-way development pattern, so all this inter bringing Caulfield together, like having a new kind of complete neighborhood in the southeast part of Oregon City, those were all kind of the pieces of the Beaver Creek along with this really goal to have low impact development and a lot of uh, green stormwater approaches. Yeah. And so looking at that kind of linear connectivity piece and the kind of uh, development within a park kind of setting, so not necessarily park space, but making sure that it, you have those uh, multi-use pathways, that you have the kind of the green approach to stormwater systems and how folks are interacting with the properties, um, I think plays well with kind of what we're looking to do here. And so um, for us as a group, you know, if there's any thoughts around, you know, the, the approach that we're proposing, if you have any feedback on the kind of minimums or maximums or safety considerations or amenities, kind of the, the size of the spaces to be able to provide the types of recreational amenities that you would envision in a neighborhood park system. And it's a little bit different than we typically do in the, the string and pearl approach, but those pearls really are going to be kind of the that neighborhood park. And so imagine like some of our um, smaller, um, I guess to give context in space and size. So um, Filbert Run Park is uh, about three and a half acres. Um, the uh, DC Ladder Up Park is just under an acre of the actual park space. Um, the, the Glen Oak Park is about nine acres total. And so you can kind of think, you know, you chop that in half, that's about four and a half acres. Um, you know, what What can you provide in those spaces? Um, what types of, of size of components are you imagining in those areas? And so if we have a recommended minimum of three acres and a three to four um, acre, I'm sorry, three to four pearls approach of three acres, three pearls, that gives you nine, that's kind of built out. Uh, if we have a minimum of two, you know, maybe they only do four total, uh, all at two acres, or they do, you know, again, one that's two and it's a little bit smaller, and then they do a couple others that are larger, and they have three total parks that have that eight acres. So um, is that reasonable? Are you comfortable with kind of that, that general approach? Are there any kind of minimum or average is that we should be looking at uh, from a design requirement perspective that, that you can think of. Please. 
Uh, so the conservation area is in addition to that yeah, minimum. To park eight. one and park two. Okay. Um, and just out of curiosity, um, that's steep mm -hmm. and then it levels off. Is some of that level ground outside of the buffer for the creek? Good question. We haven't done that analysis yet. Okay. Because, yeah, actually, my cottage cluster is near the ridge in the East Village. Which <laughs> <and laughs> is now allowed by right as Rose views. took me out for a yeah. ride around the property so and that, picked you my know, spot. <laughs> to give you the Perfect. answer, I think that 50%. So if um, you know, the 50% of that, that gap can be an open space that's publicly owned, but there could be opportunities for a little bit of small infill in the not public space of that gap area. And I think the larger question is, we don't know how many units can be in that other part of the half because the geologic hazards codes is gonna look at it. And that's really site dependent. And if any developer came today, we'd say the same thing of like, tell us what you wanna do, hire a geotech, work with our geotechnical analysis. You may be able to get one home in that whole area. You may be able to get seven, we don't know. You know, so those that that area that's below the ridge line is really, really dependent on a lot more information mm -hmm. based on a proposed development and our geologic hazard codes because that area is a historic uh, landslide area. Mm -hmm. I've seen the lidar of it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, that's there's a lot of additional work that can be done, and we wouldn't be guaranteeing any number of units until you went through the process. For the Stringer Pearls. Um, to put it in perspective, how long is that like a two mile or three oh. mile or four mile? Like that would help put in, you know, perspective in terms of, okay, a minimum of two or a minimum of three. Sure, mm -hmm. I can do a little math here really quickly. Yeah. Give me one second. And then how many slice through points with major roads, whether it's Loader or Myers mm -hmm. or? Uh, one second, I can get, well, you okay. keep talking, I'll, I'll do okay. some math. I have a question and that is, um, what kind of time frame are we talking now? Um, so we're going, you mentioned that you'll be doing some additional public outreach mm -hmm. during the autumn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most likely the planning commission will not be making any recommendation to the city commission until wintertime oh. and maybe even new 2020. Okay. Uh, the, what I like to, re, then t that's probably the direct question, but the other question is, I always say this zoning sets the table and and acquisition either happens on a, you know, when we wait for the development or through a willing seller, willing buyer. So we're just setting the table and it's really the development community which will decide when an application comes in, when these parks get, both get acquired and then, you know, is it a big enough project that it makes sense for them just to get system development credits to build some of it? Maybe they don't want to, maybe they'll pay, you know, it, that's all later negotiations at a proposed development application. But once, um, sometime in probably spring 2020 is when everything will get adopted. And I say that now, today, and everything is all subject to change through the public hearings process. Gotcha. Thank you. And another question, um, regionally within the Portland Metro Vancouver area, are there examples of, because like, top of my brain, and, I, and I'm not sure, but like mm -hmm. Fano Creek um, within um, THPRD, mm -hmm. um, to me, as you're talking, um, it sounds, it's in that Tigard, Washington County, mm -hmm. Washington Square area, it sounds very similar to this, same with Rock Creek um, in area in terms of that string, but wondering if, you know, there's some, I know there's, there's are districts, but yeah. in terms of that incorporation of all these elements, it feels very similar. I think it does. I think that, and Phil may know a little bit more because I'm not the definite parks expert, but I think the difference between Fano Creek, because mm -hmm. there's creek alongside, yeah. and then also <laughs> like the, um, sorry, the, uh, you know, the Washington County, like the trails that are along maybe the their own power line. I know yeah. there's a power line where South Trail and there's some parks that connect up. Mm -hmm. That's probably a closer version, but then ours will just be, you know, instead of a trail along a little power line, ours is more like this path along the street. So it's, okay. it's, it's the same but different. I mean, it, it, it's a corollary. I don't know if you have a, but a more, this is a more urban version of that. Okay. Where Fano Creek, I think there was a lot of existing development yeah. and they found a way to get the creek and they found to get the park where we're, we're like whole cloth, like starting from the beginning. So everything is gonna be a very urbanized, you know, uh, development. There's not, 
we, there's not a natural creek right in here. We're, we're creating the pearl and string out of a, a golf course, out of a flatter area. Uh, yeah, and I would agree. I, the, I can't think of anything offhand that has the, it, I envision it with our kind of um, condensed corridor that it's it's more of a trail system within a developed urban area as opposed to a, um, you know, utilizing some of those uh, corridor areas that have a much wider following the BPA lines and having uh, more. Okay. Or yeah. Out by the airport in Hillsboro, they have a similar type of pathway mm. through business zones it's more uh, yeah. urban okay yeah um so the linear uh, 0.63 is what i got from a very rough overlay of the um acreage from the um natural area so are you looking at my 0.63 uh, miles from here oh from you're already faster than me sorry to, to, right. to kind of where the curve is yeah that sounds about right <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe, you know, you break it up, there's probably, uh, maybe break up between if I'm understanding. Um, Glen Oak. Yeah, because that's where it's Glen Oak. Okay, what does that connectivity yeah. really look like? And Meyer, mm -hmm. down here. It is. There's a T here. There's a T here. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, what you see here are the main roads. Oregon City's subdivision ordinance has lots of smaller roads. So there'll yeah. be smaller blocks in here, but these, these large blue roads are kind of the main connector roads. And so you're really kind of like a third of a mile um, between, uh, and I'm gonna, sorry. This is Glen Oak Road. I think it was about a third of a mile from here to about here. Mm -hmm. And then, so probably okay. a little bit less from here. So this whole thing, you said about 0.6 mile, 0.8? Uh, 0.6, yeah, 0.63 Where did from- Where you start from? Uh, from the natural area down to- oh, what did I do? Um, the Traberski Way crossing. Oh, which is right here. So from here to here is about 0.6 mile. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So it's a, a very condensed, short mm -hmm. area. Yeah. The parks yeah. aren't next to each other, but they're not- yeah. yeah. I mean, you One can the... ease, I mean, the goal is when it's all developed, mm -hmm. you can easily like walk from park to park pretty easily with your family. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be some development in between the parks. Kind of like it. And one of the components we talked about was just the ease of operations and maintenance for yeah. <laughs> having, you know, so many, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have the, um, the three acre minimum is because we don't want these sites that are difficult to get out to, to mobilize, to get all your equipment off. Then you have to get back and drive to the next park and do the exact same thing versus a larger park area where you can maintain it a little bit easier uh, with the larger park area. Um, and so with, with this, you're going to have that connectivity piece. You're going to have some, you know, trailway, some pieces that you'll have to maintain along the way. You'll have the larger pearl and then the next pearl. And so it's kind of a connected space. And it gives us the opportunity, as we have had previous conversations around trying to provide that easily walkable distance from every resident to a park, uh, this provides a way for us to provide that opportunity for all the residents within this area. And within, like, for the string of pearls, because uh, uh, the different size specifications, possibilities, um, is there any thought in terms of minimum number of access points to be able to get to, let's say, that three-acre three plot? I think you're going to get that through our subdivision block. Okay. And standards, which are pretty small. Mm -hmm. So just the subdivision block standards, which I can't quote off my head, but... Oregon City has pretty robust standards. So just the street network will get you there pretty, pretty quickly. That was that like, your question? Yeah, okay. so, just so I think developers some often, you know, have different yeah. perspectives. Yeah, so in Oregon um, City with the subdivision code, we don't have the, we don't, we can't really approve a situation unless there's like a cliff where you have to walk all around to get to the thing that's behind you. We really have, and so even if you don't have vehicular connections, we might require pedestrian connections between two areas. This is really flat. It's gonna be a really pretty traditional subdivision block pattern. 
And then remind me, sorry, if so many questions, sure. remind me for the street plan, and maybe it's not developed yet, in terms of the transit plan for like bikes, is that something that'll be incorporated on the streets or is that something that could potentially be incorporated within this 30 foot wide um, connectivity that then has the 11 you know, foot path or whatever? Uh, because to me, that affects how that space is used. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think a ped bikeway is part of that, in that 30 feet, definitely. Okay. Um, in Beaver Creek Road, we're looking at bike lanes. It'll either be, you know, traditional bike lanes. We're actually even kind of playing around. Can we get a cycle track in? Can we have an off-site area? So our engineers are, you know, we've given them some creative things to look at. Local streets are local streets, so bikes will be on local streets. Um, this uh, parkway area, the Holly Lane extension, I think we do want the ped to be a ped bikeway. So peds, uh, bikes will not be on the, really on that part of Holly Lane. It'll be, you know, maybe it'll be parking cars. I mean, you probably can still have bikes if you're on the street. But we want really the, we want that feeling that you could bike that whole section on a, a grade separated bike. And then as a visual person, 30 feet is a little wider than this room. Because I'm guessing this is about 25 feet. So just try and, okay. Yeah. And then in terms of current trends that I know within Portland Parks, we're experiencing issues of mixed youth paths with people on wheels. Um, mm -hmm. And then also um, people walking. Um, a pace of a child or a dog is very different than a pace of somebody commuting versus a pace of a family out for a daily stroll. Yeah. So in terms of whether it's one path or if it's you know, concurrent paths. Mm -hmm. Like, so in terms of the width, that so, yeah. to me seems, yeah. along with benches and garbages and all those other things, thinking about, okay, yeah. if that 30 feet, mm -hmm. um, it becomes much narrower yeah. once you start thinking mm -hmm. in a wider. And, and I think uh, to that point, the, um, uh, the string and pearl approach with the uh, mixed use path areas, I would envision as maybe being a little bit different than the, um, the other corridor areas, so near the BPA lines, where you maybe have some of those um, commuter kind of separated. Um, but we can look at. Yeah, I'll work with Phil. I know yeah. the best practice is always morphing as people are actually <laughs> fully uh, engaging and using our you know shared paths in Portland. So we'll kind of take a look and see. I mean, if and if it has to be uh, widened. This is, this is the time to do it because mm -hmm. we will be adopting a street section. Yeah. And that's once we adopt that street section, that is what we can exact. And so we want to make sure we have it right. But we also don't want to, you know, we can't just suddenly make up a giant one. So, you know, what's the appropriate width for the things we want to get? Yeah. Um, that would be attached, it would be part of the right way, that would be the string. And that is, you know, it's a multimodal, uh, you know, way. What about separate paths? Yeah, I think uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not an expert on it, so I will definitely take a look and, and, and we come back, we can kind of say based on what we heard and what we understand yeah. and talking to, you know, other park staff and other cities, what they found out and, you know, what we think. Um, this right. is still going to be a neighborhood park. I mean, not like, not yeah. like people aren't going to come to this from other places, but a lot of the uses are going to be people who are coming out of their houses yeah. in this area. So I don't think it's, this is not Waterfront Park, Portland, where they're having all this ped bike problems with all the bike commuters. So it's like, how do we learn our lessons there, but then scale it to what makes sense for what this area will be? Because we, we have our regional trail um, kind of uh, definition, and then we have our, you know, our, our neighborhood or uh, community kind of connectivity pieces. And so this would be, you know, the I, I think the string and pearls approach along the corridor uh, would probably be more in fitting with uh, kind of more of the neighborhood approach as opposed to uh, more of the regional trails pieces where you might want to look at really seriously look at having a, you know, separation of the uh, commuter traffic versus mm -hmm. pedestrians and and that kind of thing and but bike and little kids are definitely different speeds so that's yeah. absolutely as a mother i know that. <laughs> right, just, i watch my you know you or you watch my your four-year-old trying to bike and then suddenly yeah. someone's like well, <laughs> a lot of that depends on design though if you've got yeah. you know a curvilinear yeah, right. paths going through and then you've got 
you empty into a, a park space where you've got benches and mm -hmm. other activities, that tends to slow down the the, the cross-country commuters, mm -hmm. and they're going to look for a different way yeah. to get yeah. from point A to point yeah, B. Yeah, and that way very well may be Beaver Creek Road. I mean, yeah. that's kind of more commuters. But um, I, I would also say, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of roundabouts. They're not pedestrian friendly. Uh, it, it really, if you're trying to walk from one, one spot to the other, the best way to, to get from there is through a conventional, you know, lighted intersection. Uh, if you have to walk quite a ways around a roundabout, uh, it kind of discourages uh, pedestrian activities. And I'm a little concerned about uh, where this open space crosses some of these major roads is how how you're going to get the people from one side of the road to the other side. And if you've got roundabouts going to that area, how that, that interface. So with. these will be not, nothing inside this concept plan area warrants okay. any signals. I mean, these will all be um, either stop signs, you know, two way stop signs, four way stop signs. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no stop signs depending on okay. who's interacting with whom. So the only signals or roundabout questions are right here at Myers. Glen Oak, uh, and then Loader, which is farther up. Okay. And so just to let you know, and this wasn't put in the slide, but the goal is to have only access to the Beaver Creek Road concept plan left turns being at these main intersections. So there might be some right in, right outs from smaller roads here, but we will not allow left turns, unsignalized left turns on, or unsignalized or button on roundabouts on Beaver Creek Road. Uh, going southbound and one thing that does is that really preserves that parkway so you actually when you reduce the number of access points um, you can get a lot more cars through so your capacity greatly increases when you really reduce your access points is like we're learning when we do all these access control projects on Alala Avenue or Beaver Creek Road with all these existing um, driveways it's really hard uh, but so that that's imagine really just these key few main places in and then right in, right out for the other smaller streets. I'm curious, does Oregon City uh, ascribe to the complete streets concept, you know, where you have the, the reduced um, right away widths and the, the more of the buildings right up closer to the, you know, the idea is that it, it, you've got a constricted roadway, but you're actually moving traffic through. Yeah, I, I think we do see the all the tools in complete streets are really important. I don't think we've adopted that word. Okay. But, um, you know, as we, you know, I'm not a transportation engineer, but you talk to transportation engineers and you can build, you know, a five lane road or a three lane road, but if you don't use any traffic calming, people will drive to the level that they feel comfortable exactly. in. Mm -hmm. So it's all about street design that can get, and so, yeah, yeah, I actually don't have an opinion on signals versus roundabouts, they have pros and cons, but what I'm hearing from people that are really excited about roundabouts are um, that when you are non-peak hours uh, and you might have all green lights on Beaver Creek, um, you tend to speed more. Mm -hmm. um, but when you are on non-peak hours in roundabouts, you have to slow down between each roundabout and you don't get up to speed again. So um, it could slow down the, the speed of cars on non-peak times um, that you may not have on those like nights and afternoons when all those lights are all lined up green because no one's using them. So there's different pros and cons. And as we go through the public process, we're going to have more links to PDFs for you know, transportation studies and more background. And you know, really, this is one of those leadership and directions to the city commission. So I encourage you all as individuals Feel free to make comment, get involved. Uh, we're gonna have that public process that goes through. I know a lot of people are, have a lot of opinions either side. Um, and then we'll bring those in with all that constructability and cost questions and actually just how much space. So that we're gonna give the city commission a lot of um, data and a lot of information to let them kind of figure out next steps on it. So going back, and I just noticed the 2008 date earlier, going back 11, 12, 13 yeah. years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of this you're not getting tonight, um, but these streets are not meant to be alternatives to Beaver Creek. And the original recommendation was they be designed to be neighborhood streets, yeah, yeah, not, neighborhood. not commuter yeah. alternates. The other thing, we dreamers. Um, the, if this builds out in keeping with what 
some of the original input was. It discourages owning a car um, or it encourages there's work live space, there'll be a light industrial employment, there'll be residential. Part of the planning was that you could live and work on this property. And you know, if you need a car, it's to get out and go some to Fred Meyer or something. But that within the concept area, you should, it's walkable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not long distances. It is beautifully level. It's a golf course. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and it's going to depend on the developers and what comes out of it. But, you know, the original plan um, would discourage a lot of active traffic on those roads. And I'm hoping the final plan continues to do that. Yeah, that being said, I always say as planner, more connections is better. So it's not that we're not we're not cul de sacking this neighborhood. No. <laughs> uh, we will provide connections to the world outside because um, connections are better. But you design to make people have to work really hard to use those connections that are outside the area. So connections are good because you don't want to have pinch points, but you don't want to have those connections be easily used as the, the alternate. They need to, you know, you gotta work extra harder. So you have to drive much slower. You gotta work harder to have to use that as your secondary alternate connection. So do you, f any other questions? Do you feel we're on the right kind of path for the design in this area for parks and green spaces, trails? With what you have to work with, it seems like you're on the right track. Yeah. Okay. With what you have to work with, the, your constraints, yeah. No, I appreciate, it um, seems like you're taking a very proactive approach in how you're looking at this, so I like it. <clears throat> I've always liked the linear park ideas. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited. I've, we've, for years in planning, everyone's like, we need a park, but like, these, you know, small the applications come in and we and we don't have any code and we yeah. can't so I just like this is our really our probably one of our only main big opportunities to get park exaction as part of the development. The one thing the, the other reason why I we're writing all of this which I didn't put in the memo in the uh, PowerPoint is since 2008 there is a clear direction of state law for clear and objective standards for housing which basically says you have to create implementable zoning that is clear objective like math, like yes, no, this number, that number, um, to somewhere someone can fill out a worksheet or apply for something really easily, and there's not any discretion. That being said, somebody always can go through a discretionary path, which would be like a master plan. So if, if a developer looked at this and said, I don't really want to build this, I can go through a master plan process. They still have to show compliance with a comprehensive plan, but it's and the concept plan, but it's more substantial compliance, not any particular thing. Um, but as, as a city, we're required to find that clear and objective path. This whole concept plan assumed master plan implementation. Mm. Like we'd all negotiate, and we'd figure it out, and we'd draw some things, and there'd be an agreement, and it would figure out. That still can totally happen. But the hard part that I've had this spring and summer is, oh gosh, we wrote a whole plan thinking we could do something we can't do now. So we need to write this clear and objective path. And so really what this, everything we're doing here is trying to write code for in lieu of negotiating where the park is gonna go. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Great. Any questions, concerns? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Well, I encourage you all to stay involved and if you aren't on our mailing list, go on to the project page, on the planning page, and put your email in, and you'll get an email from me every two weeks with the Planning Commission agenda and the updates on what's happening, <laughs> and the City Commission agenda. So if you do want to follow the process, it's a great way to, to be involved. I, we have over 200 people on the interested parties list, and they, they get on the e -blast. Thank you very sure. much. Very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, and then the other items on the agenda, future agenda items. So if there's anything that we'd like to add, I will say that uh, to Bill's question about uh, the Buena Vista House, we do have that on the agenda coming up for our next meeting scheduled for September 26th. So we will uh, update the group at that meeting. Um, 
uh, if there was a request to have a conversation at this meeting, I, I will say we had a presentation with the city commission and received some um, feedback, uh, not necessarily specific direction from the group, but some, definitely some feedback. And so we're kind of working behind the scenes to um, move that forward and we'll continue to have conversations with the friends of Buena Vista Clubhouse uh, to look at next steps, but we'll have probably a, a more thorough presentation at our September 26th meeting. Uh, but if there's any other future agenda items that you'd like to uh, add, I'd be happy to hear them. Yeah, um, at the 26th meeting in September, um, I think Troy and I will be prepared to show um, any format for the goals, the oh, goals. Oh, great. Um, I thought I had sent it to him a couple weeks ago and I evidently had an email fail, so it's probably still in my outbox. <laughs> So, but we should have that ready for presentation. Mm -hmm. Yep. On the Buena Vista House, too, if you haven't watched the meeting from last week, please feel free to avail yourself of the video online. It's informative. Entertaining. <laughs> it's informative. <All> right. <laughs> Uh, so with that, our future uh, meeting again is on September 26th. This is our next meeting. And uh, All right. meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Oh.